Hello and welcome to the session on pre-Socratic philosophy. The pre-Socratics were 6th and 5th century BC Greek thinkers who introduced a new way of inquiry into the world and the place of human beings in it. They were recognized in antiquity as the first philosophers and scientists of the Western tradition. This unit is a general introduction to the most important pre-Socratic philosophers and the main uh, themes of pre-Socratic thought. More detailed discussions on each pre-Socratic philosophers can be found in forthcoming units. Our understanding of the pre-Socratics is complicated by the incomplete nature of our evidence. Most of them wrote at least one book, short pieces of prose writings, it seems, or in some cases, poems of not great length. But no complete work survives. Instead, we are dependent on later philosophers, historians, and compilers of collections of ancient wisdom for disconnected quotations and reports about their views. In some cases, these sources had direct access to the works of the pre-Socratics. But in many others, the line is indirect and often depends on the work of Aristotle and Theophratus. The sources for the fragments and testimonials made selective use of the material available to them in accordance with their own special and varied interests in the early thinkers. The term pre-Socratic philosophers was made current by Hermann Diles in the 19th century and was meant to mark a contrast between Socrates who was interested in moral problems and his predecessors who were supposed to be primarily concerned with cosmological and physical speculation. Pre-Socratic, if taken strictly as a chronological term, is not quite accurate, for the last of them were contemporaneous with Socrates and even Plato. 7th century BC poet Hesiod tells the traditional story of the Olympian gods, beginning with Chaos, a vague divine primordial entity or condition. From Chaos, a sequence of gods is generated, often by sexual congress, but sometimes no particular cause is given. Each divine figure that arises is connected with a part of the physical universe, so his theogony is also a cosmogony. The divinities come to be and struggle violently among themselves. Finally, Zeus triumphs and establishes and maintains an order of power among the others who remain. Hesiod's world is one in which the major divinities are individuals who behave like superhuman beings. Some of the others are personified characteristics. For the Greeks, the fundamental properties of divinity are immortality and power. And each of Hesiod's characters has these properties. Hesiod's story is like a vast Hollywood style family history with envy, rage, love and lust all playing important parts in the coming to be of the world as we know it. The earliest rulers of the universe are violently overthrown by their offspring. In a second poem, Works and Days, Hesiod pays more attention to human beings, telling the story of earlier, greater creatures who died or were destroyed by themselves or Zeus. Humans were created by Zeus, are under his power, and are subject to his judgment and to divine intervention for either good or ill. Hesiod's world, like Homer's, is one that is God-saturated where the gods may intervene in all aspects of the world, from the weather to mundane particulars of human life, reaching into the ordinary world order from outside in a way that humans must accept but cannot ultimately understand. The pre-Socratics reject this account. Instead, seeing the world as a cosmos, a ordered natural arrangement that is inherently intelligible, and no subject to supernatural intervention. Pre-Socratic thought exhibits a significant difference not only in its understanding of the nature of the world, 
but also in its view of the sort of explanation of it that is possible. Heraclitus asserts that those who love wisdom must be inquirers into many things. Enquiry alone is not sufficient. For Heraclitus, there is an underlying principle that unites and explains everything. It is this that others have failed to see and understand. According to Heraclitus, Hesiod was a traditional source of information about the gods. Pythagoras was renowned for his learning and especially views about how one ought to live. Xenophanes taught about the proper view of the gods and the natural world. The Milesians. The Milesian school is an early pre-Socratic school of philosophy founded in the 6th century BC in the Ionian town of Milets. The major philosophers included under this label are Thales, Naximander and Anaximenes, who held quite distinct views on most subjects. So that the grouping is more one of geographical convenience than one of shared opinions. The Milesians were also more focused on nature than on reason and thought like the later Ionians. The Milesians introduced new opinions on how the world was organized, in which natural phenomena were explained solely by the will of anthropomorphized gods. They are sometimes described as philosophers of nature, and they presented a view of nature in terms of methodologically observable entities, and therefore represented one of the first attempts to make philosophy truly scientific. In metaphysics, they defined all things by their quintessential substance of which the universe was formed and which was the source of all life. However, they differed widely in how they conceived of this substance. In cosmology, they also differed in the way they conceived of the universe. Thales believed that the earth was floating in water. Anaximander placed the earth at the center of a universe composed of hollow concentric wheels filled with fire and pierced by holes at various intervals. Anaximen saw the sun and the moon as flat disks traveling around a heavenly canopy on which the stars are fixed. Xenophanes of Colophon and Heraclitus of Ephesus. Xenophanes and Heraclitus continue the Milesian interest in the, in the nature of the physical world and both offer cosmological accounts. Yet they go further than the Milesians. Both explore the possibility of human understanding and question its limits. Xenophanes has come to be seen as an original thinker in his own right who influenced later philosophers trying to distinguish the realms of the human and the divine and exploring the possibility that human beings can gain knowledge and wisdom. Xenophanes claims that all meteorological phenomena are clouds, colored, moving and incandescent. Clouds are fed by exhalations from the land and sea. His explanations of meteorological and heavenly phenomena lead to a naturalistic science. Xenophane says that the star-like phenomena seen when aboard ship, which some call the Dioscuri, are cloudlets glimmering because of their kind of motion. That meteorological phenomena are not divine is not all that Xenophanes has to say about the gods. He notes anthropomorphic tendencies in conceptions of the gods. He also famously suggests that horses, oxen, and lions would have equine, bovine, and leonine gods. Xenophanes also makes positive claims about the nature of the divine, including the claim that there is a single greatest god. While indifferent to the affairs of human beings, Xenophanes' divine being understands and controls a cosmos that is infused with divine thinking. Moreover, Xenophanes is optimistic about the capacities of human intelligence. Having already removed the gods as bearers of knowledge to humans, denying that the divine takes an active interest in what mortals can or cannot know, Xenophanes asserts 
the conclusion to be drawn from his naturalistic interpretation of phenomena. That way, we discover better. As he says, this is an optimistic conclusion, suggesting that human thought can mimic divine understanding, at least to some degree. Xenophane stresses the difficulty of coming to certainty, particularly about things beyond our direct experience. Heraclitus claiming that human perspective law must harmonize with divine law. But he is also asserting that divine law encompasses both the universal laws of the cosmos itself and the particular laws of men. The cosmos itself is an intelligent, eternal system that orders and regulates itself in an intelligent way. We can come to grasp and understand at least part of this divine system. Heraclitus regards the order of cosmos as like a language that can be read or heard and understood by those who are attuned to it. The sheer accumulation of information is not the same as wisdom. Although the evidence of the senses is important, careful and thoughtful inquiry is also necessary. Those who are lovers of wisdom must be good inquirers into many things and must be able to grasp how the phenomena are signs or evidences of larger order. That evidence is the interplay of opposing states and forces, which Heraclitus points to by claims about the unity of opposites and the roles of strife in human life as well as in the cosmos. There are fragments that proclaim the unity or identity of opposites. The road up and down are one and the same. An Eximander's system of just reciprocity ordered by time is replaced by a system governed by war. The changes and alterations that constitute the processes of the cosmos are regular and capable of being understood by one who can speak the language of the logos and thus interpret properly. Heraclitus treats soul as the seat of emotion, movement, and intellect. For Heraclitus, soul is a stuff that is affected by changes along the hot, cold, and wet, dry continua. Although Heraclitus says that it is only divine nature that has complete understanding, his linking of fire with the logos and the divine along with his view that the best and wisest soul is hot and dry suggests that humans who care for their souls and search for the truth contained in the Logos can overcome human ignorance and approach understanding. Parmenides of Elea. Parmenides, born in 510 BC in the Greek colony of Elea in southern Italy, explores the nature of philosophical inquiry, concentrating less on knowledge or understanding than on what can be understood. Xenophanes identified genuine knowledge with the grasping of the sure and certain truth. Heraclitus had asserted that divine nature, not human, has right understanding. Parmenides argues that human thought can reach genuine knowledge or understanding and that there can be certain marks or signs that act as guarantees that the goal of knowledge has been reached. A fundamental part of Parmenides' claim is that what must be is more noble than what is merely contingent, which can be the object only of belief. Parmenides gives us a poem in Homeric Hexameters narrating the journey of a young man who is taken to meet a goddess who promises to teach him. The content of the story the goddess tells is not the knowledge that will allow humans by having it to know. Rather, the goddess gives the tools to acquire that knowledge himself. The goddess does not provide a list of true prepositions as a body of knowledge for him to acquire and false ones to be avoided. For Parmenides, the mark of what is known is that it is something that genuinely is with no taint of what is not. The roots are methods of inquiry. Keeping on the correct route will bring one to what is, the real object of thought and understanding. The truth, she tells, reveals a mark of its own truth. 
it is testable by reason or thought itself. One can reach a decision or determination of the truth solely through use of his logos. Logos here means thinking or reasoning. The arguments demonstrate how what is must be and in applying these arguments as tests against any suggested basic entity in the pre-Socratic search for ultimate causes or principles. One can think well or badly. Correct thinking is that which takes the correct route and so reaches what is. The models on the incorrect route are thinking, but their thoughts have no real object and so cannot be completed or perfected by reaching the truth. Anything that genuinely is cannot be subject to coming to be or passing away must be of a single nature and must be complete in the sense of being unchangeably and unalterably what it is. These are signs for what any ultimate cause or principle must be like. If it is to be satisfactory as a principle, as something that can be known, only an entity which is in the complete way can be grasped and understood in its entirety by thought. The problem of models is that they mistake what they perceive for what there is. As long as one realizes that the world of perception is not genuinely real and cannot therefore be the object of knowledge, it may be possible for there to be justified belief about the cosmos. Parmenides marks a sharp distinction between being and becoming and between knowledge and perception-based belief or opinion. The Pythagorean tradition. In the last quarter of the 6th century before Parmenides' birth, Pythagoras of Simos, an Aegean island, arrived in Croton in southern Italy. He established a community of followers who adopted his political views which favored rule by the better people and also the way of life he recommended on what seems to have been more or less philosophical basis. The traditional view has been that the aristocracy, the better people, generally meant the rich. But Burkert notes that as early as the 4th century BC, there were two traditions about Pythagoras. One that meshes with the traditional view and associates Pythagoras with political tyrants and another that credits him with rejecting tyrannies for aristocracies that might not have been grounded in wealth. The Pythagorean archites lived in a democracy and seems to have argued for fair and proportionate dealings between rich and poor. The Pythagorean way of life included adherence to certain prescriptions including religious rights and dietary restrictions. Like Socrates, Pythagoras wrote nothing himself, but had a great influence on those who followed him. He had a reputation for great learning and wisdom, although he was treated satirically by both Xenophanes and Heraclitus. The details of Pythagoras' views seems to have advocated the immortality of the soul. It is a novel idea among the Greeks also developed in Orphic religion and uh, the possibility of the transmigration of the human soul after death into other animal forms. Pythagorean writers after his own time stressed the mathematical structure and order of the universe. This is often attributed directly to Pythagoras. But recent scholarship has shown that the evidence for attributing this mathematically based cosmology to Pythagoras himself is convoluted and doubtful. The early Pythagoreans conceived of nature as a structured system ordered by number and that such post parmenidian Pythagoreans as Philolos had more complicated views about the relation between mathematics and cosmology than it is reasonable to suppose Pythagoras himself could have advanced. The Pythagorean tradition thus includes two strains. There are reports of a split in the period after Pythagoras' death 
between what we would term the more philosophically inclined Pythagoreans and others who primarily adopted the Pythagorean ethical, religious and political attitudes. The latter, called the Accusmatici, followed the Pythagorean precepts or Accusmata, which means things heard. The former, the philosophical Pythagoreans, were the called Mathematici, and while they recognized that the Accusmatici were indeed Pythagoreans by virtue of accepting Pythagorean precepts, they claimed that they themselves were the true followers of Pythagoras. Pre-Socratic atomism. The pluralism of Anaxagoras and Empedocles maintained the electric structures on metaphysically acceptable basic entities by adopting an irreducible pluralism of stuffs, meeting these standards that could pass on their qualities to items constructed from them. Ancient atomism responded more radically. All atoms are made of the same stuff, solid matter, in itself otherwise indeterminate, differing from one another only in shape, position, arrangement. In addition, the pre-Socratic atomists, Lucippus and Democritus, enthusiastically endorsed the reality of the empty or void. The void is what separates atoms. Like Anaxagoras, the atomists consider all phenomenal objects and characteristics as emerging from the background mixture. In the case of atomism, the mix of atoms and void. Everything is constructed of atoms and void. The shapes of the atoms and their arrangement with respect to each other give physical objects their apparent characteristics. As Democritus says, by convention, sweet, and by convention, bitter, by convention, hot, by convention, cold, by convention, color, in reality, atoms and void. For example, Theophrastus says that the flavors differ according to the shapes of the atoms that compose various objects. Simplicius reports that things composed of sharp and very fine atoms in similar positions are hot and fiery. Those composed of atoms with the opposite character come to be cold and watery. Moreover, Theophrastus reports that the atomists explain why iron is harder than lead, but lighter. It is harder because of the uneven arrangements of the atoms that make it up. Lighter because it contains more void than lead. Lead, on the other hand, has less void than iron. But the even arrangement of the atoms makes lead easier to cut or to blend. Democritus says that there are two kinds of knowing, one through the senses and the other through the understanding. The one through the understanding he calls genuine, witnessing to its trustworthiness in deciding truth. The one through the senses he names bastard, denying it steadfastness in the discernment of what is true. The evidence of the senses when properly interpreted by reason can be taken as a guide to reality. We just need to know how to follow this guide through proper reasoning so as to reach the truth. In addition to fragments advancing these metaphysical and physical doctrines, there are a number of ethical fragments attributed to Democritus. Although a passage reported in John Tobias seems to link moderation and cheerfulness with small measured movements in the soul and says that excess and deficiencies give rise to large movements. It is unclear whether or how these claims are directly related to the metaphysical aspects of atomism. Democritus was identified in antiquity with the idea of good cheer as the proper guiding objective in living one's life. Let us summarize what we have discussed so far. The range of pre-Socratic thought shows that the first philosophers were not merely physicists. Their interests extended to religious and ethical thought, the nature of understanding, mathematics, meteorology, the nature of explanation, and the roles of mechanism, matter, form, 
and structure in the world. Almost all the pre-Socratics seem to have something to say about embryology and fragments of Diogenes and Empedocles shows a keen interest in the structures of the body, the overlap between ancient philosophy and ancient medicine is of growing interest to scholars of early Greek thought. Recent discoveries such as the Derveni papyrus shows that interest in and knowledge of the early philosophers was not necessarily limited to a small audience of rationalistic intellectuals. They passed on many of what later became the basic concerns of philosophy to Plato and Aristotle and ultimately to the whole tradition of Western philosophical thought. Hope that you can answer the questions given here. Write a short note on the influences and impact of pre-Socratic Greek philosophy in the modern world of thought. Discuss the practical contributions of pre-Socratic Greek philosophy. Explain the mathematical features of pre-Socratic Greek philosophy. Who are the major philosophers included under the Milesian school of thought? What is the Pythagorean theorem? Compare the ideas of Xenophanes of Colophon and Heraclitus of Ephesus. Analyze the cosmological doctrines of pre-Socratic Greek philosophy. Hope that you may go through the reference books for further reading. The Fragments of Parmenides, a critical text with introduction and translation, the ancient testimonial and a commentary, written by A. H. Coxon in 2009, published by Parmenides Publishing, Las Vegas. Anaxagoras of Clazomene, Fragments, text and translation with notes and essay, written by P. Kurt in 2007, published by University of Toronto Press, Toronto. Parmenides of Ilia, Fragments, written by D. Gallup in 1984, published by University of Toronto Press, Toronto. The Texts of Early Greek Philosophy, written by D. W. Graham in 2010, published by Cambridge University Press, Cambridge. Philolus of Croton, Pythagorean and Pre-Socratic, written by C. Hoffman in 1993, published by Cambridge University Press, Cambridge. The Art and Thought of Heraclitus, written by C. H. Khan in 1979, published by Cambridge University Press, Cambridge. Thank you for watching this program. We can meet again with uh, another topic. Till then, take care.